Cool, welcome to Building Appropriate Teams. The first section of this talk is titled, Who Are You Though? In which we're gonna cover, Who Am I Though? So, I'm Joel. I didn't know how this would be set up, but. <laughs> it's over here. Um, so this is a page on my site where I introduce myself. And then this is me introducing myself using a page on my site where I introduce myself. This is my name, this is my face, but more upside down and sad and a cartoon. Uh, this is how I'm currently framing myself within the industry, and this is how long I've been framing and reframing my titles. This is my first website. It's bad. I was bad, you can see. I had um, a corner on my site for each of my friends, and as you can see, there were a lot of openings. <laughs> When I was 15, a tech company hired me to design and build their intranet. So I made it in Flash and put big aqua buttons on it and said, this is professional. And they paid me. And I spent the next few years making a lot of shitty websites. And at some point, my first full-time gig was at a big Israeli agency as a web designer, where I continued this tradition, <laughs> but this time for huge telecom and insurance companies. Uh, I moved to the States for school, uh, I spent a long while at a YC startup called Amicus to make social outreach tools for nonprofits. We did a lot of really good work. Uh, and then an even longer time at a company that makes simple and fun developer tools for the cloud, which is a thing, I promise you. Um, two of these years were spent building and leading the design org. So if you know uh, Noah Levin, who manages design at Figma, at the time he looked at the team and said, damn, that's a good team. I'm paraphrasing. Um, so I think we were onto something, and hopefully that gives me like a little bit of credibility to talk with you about this stuff today. Uh, recently, I left that cool developer tools company to join a cool developer tools company. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. Uh, at GitHub, I work on the code team. We are responsible for PRs and code review and other very low pressure stuff that no one uses. Uh, if you have heard of me before, it's probably through my writing. I publish infrequently, but when I do, I try to make it count. Um, I also have a newsletter, which you should sign up for if you want to be notified about upcoming gems, such as, uh, I know. Um, another thing I've been doing over the past few years is giving a talk called Full Stack Anxiety. Um, the talk discussed the difficulties of working in an industry that changes as rapidly as ours, and then how to decide in which direction to grow. Uh, if you want a link to the full like 40 minute talk, ping me later. But the talk introduced this idea of your stack. Uh, and I think that's relevant to today's talk. And by think, I mean no, because I, I put it together. Um, so we're going to go over the basics. Every person, or murderous HBO cyborg, has uh, a certain set of abilities, of strengths and weaknesses. And these strengths and skills are your stack, which here we're representing in this graph. So here, just for the, the point of this talk, I'm, I'm using a few skills as examples. So research skills, the ability to, oh, you don't need to take photos, I'm gonna show a ton of these. Um, so research skills, um, user experience skills, so more in like the UX flow, information architecture side, UI skills, visual design, development skills, business context and understanding, and then teaching. So competency at mentoring and explaining concepts. So on this graph, you could be a bunch of things, right? You could be a UX designer. This would be your shape. So each point here represents um, how competent you are at a certain thing. So the higher you are, the closer to the label, the more you have competency at that. So this is a UX designer. You could be a visual designer who codes. You could be a research specialist. You could be a design strategist. You could be more technical or more detail-oriented or more high-level or leadership-driven. Um, you could have experience in ethnographic research or prototyping or Figma or React or iOS patterns. Right? Bottom line, your shape is going to be different. And that brings us to today's talk, how to build appropriate teams. So we're going to talk about how to design your teams so that they accomplish your company's specific goals. So if each person has their own unique shape or stack, then by putting them together, you're getting your team's stack. Right, these are the skills and strengths represented on your team. And it's not only an aggregate of visual skills, but these different skills and experiences also affect each other. So the team stack is gonna change over time, and we'll see that in a bit. The stack also surfaces gaps. 
So in this imaginary team, there's a lot of strength in UX and development stuff, but no one has business context. There's not much research experience, and then visual design is also lacking. Right? And this might be fine in some contexts. Maybe you're at a stage where you're willing to forgo some of that foundational research just to ship quicker. Uh, maybe you're using design systems that handle the visuals. Maybe you have a business-driven PM that works with your designers on that stuff, so it's not as important to hire for that. But then in different circumstances, it might be more important to fill these gaps. So it really depends on what your team and company needs in order to be successful. So no two companies are the same. And yet, has anyone seen this job description before? Right, so I'm not poking fun at any of these things, right? If you breeze through them, it's not really important to breeze through them. Um, each of these things could be a very valid thing to ask for a designer to have. But I think this is what usually happens. So young startups generally trust that larger companies, especially those known for design like Facebook or Airbnb, have their shit together, right? And so we don't really understand necessarily the job posting, but we're like, let's take it. It's probably going to work for us. And so we end up with a similar team makeup as like, say, Airbnb, right? Airbnb is successful, same team makeup, profit. But the same team makeup... <laughs> It might see a ton of success in one context, but fall completely flat in another. And an important step I see a lot of teams skipping is asking themselves why they need certain skills. So our titles have changed a lot over the years. And with them, our responsibilities keep shifting. And even this one title that, as an industry, we've standardized on, this title and value set, it represents such a crazy range of different types of expectations and assumptions and responsibilities in each different company. So nothing is set in stone, and this title is probably ephemeral too. Right? In a few years, we might be called life designers. Yeah. Or scavengers in a post-apocalyptic USA, depending on what happens. This also means that our current value set is not objectively right, and you can question it. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to question that status quo. We're going to figure out what's right for us specifically. I'm not going to cover org structure, so like director, PMs, whatever, how people interact with each other, but rather how to determine who to hire. We're going to do a quick voice break so I can end this. Everyone's like, yeah, please. Cool. So these are the steps we're going to cover. We're going to first learn, so build knowledge in our industry and then analyze our own teams and companies' needs. And Evolve is iterating on what we come up with regularly. So we're going to start with learning. I'm going to touch on this fairly briefly because it's pretty straightforward. Um, but when I say don't copy a job description, I really don't mean don't look at it. Um, treating other companies as case studies and looking at their successes and avoiding their mistakes can save you a lot of time and pain. So while you're doing this, though, you have to understand that every company has its own set of circumstances, of challenges, of products, internal politics, budgetary constraints, etc. It's going to be different for you. As long as you understand that, while you're doing the research, it'll be fine. So you should... Okay, we're all going to make mistakes. <laughs> you should. You should make mistakes. No, we're all going to make mistakes. We're not going to avoid them all. But making a mistake in team composition can carry a really long-term cost. So avoiding that can be a very big win for you. So doing the research is very important. So look at every job description you can out there, anything that is relevant to your team. See what's in there, what skills people are hiring for, what resonates with you. And learn from people who've built design teams. So our industry has an incredible amount of knowledge online right now, more than there's ever been before. There's podcasts like Design Details and High Resolution. There's the Intercom blog. All of these have really valuable insights from leaders who've built teams. So why did they make the choices they did? Which of those choices is applicable to us? And you can also run your questions by those leaders. So our industry is also incredibly generous with their time if you're respectful of it. So if you are building a team and you have a bunch of questions about building that, please reach out to other people. It's going to be really useful. Learn, learn as much as you can. And we're doing all of this to build an idea of which skills or traits could be valuable to us. Right? You're about to use this in the next step. Spoiler alert. So try to be a sponge until you can't be a sponge anymore. This is going to help you a lot. 
two, analyze. Um, this is going to be the most important section of the talk. So if you only take this away, that's fine. Everyone focus. Forget who I am if you need to. Um, and this is going to be the process through which we build our job descriptions. We're going to start by spitting all of those skills we learned in the first step onto a document. Now, don't limit these to what your idea of a designer is. Instead, include all of the things that are both design-related and design-adjacent. Uh, and I'll show you what that is in a sec. So start by going wide. So this is a sample of what might be on that page. Um, it's not comprehensive, but it's going to serve a bit as um, a starting point for our example. And you don't have to read this list. It's just a bunch of random examples. Like I said, it's not comprehensive. Um, these skills might be relevant to our needs, and that's why they're on this page. Right? There's design skills like visual design. There's engineering skills like back end and front end. There's marketing skills like writing. This is what I mean by design adjacent. There are things that designers could do, but don't necessarily need to do. So to start filtering this list down, which is what we're going to keep doing until we get to our job description, we're going to figure out what our company needs. Right? First question, we're starting at the broad lens of a company. OK, so in this example, we are working for the quintessential San Francisco startup, as I understand it as a New Yorker, the startup that uses artificial intelligence to provide quality health care for your pets. So just so you know what kind of person I am, I am the kind of person who will design a logo to make a stupid pun that half of the audience doesn't appreciate. Um, anyway, Neural Vetworks, the AI animal <laughs> healthcare startup, is probably exactly what the world needs right now. And it's going to serve as our example for this process. Um, so let's see what Neural Vetworks needs in order to succeed. So these are our first two realities of this startup, right? Our current product is a mess and our product needs to seem professional. And these realities are going to start to reveal which skills the company needs to hire for. So from that list before, I'm going to start highlighting a few skills. So to fix the mess, we're going to highlight information architecture, system design, and service design. They're skills that we probably need in the healthcare industry. To seem professional, let's highlight visual design, Figma for quick iteration, and writing skills for better copy. And also, we need a clear vision, clear product vision, and we need specialists in all of the things that we touch. So AI, healthcare, pets. Um, so let's start highlighting skills for that. So we're adding industry knowledge and designing for artificial intelligence. I know Stephanie's going to talk a bit more about that kind of stuff later. Um, as well as product sense, strategic thinking, and business sense to build that compelling long-term vision. Right? So we're, we're basing these off of not what we think other people need for this role, but what we need specifically to solve our problems. We're also going to add leadership qualities and presentation skills because then people are going to need to sell that vision to leaders. Right? These are all skills that we'll probably need in the company. And also, we need to iterate and ship quickly without many engineers. Anyone in a startup has, has felt this way before? Every hand goes up? No, I'm just kidding. One hand went up. I don't know why I did that. Uh, we need to make sure we're building the right stuff is the next thing. So classic startup problems. So let's add front end and back end skills since we don't have enough engineers. Uh, and we should include qualitative research and rapid prototyping so we don't waste our time. And also we're not selling enough. So yeah, okay, startups have a lot of needs and we're going to have to deal with that. But for that, let's add data analysis and then the ability to say growth hacking with a straight face. So what we're left with are design and design adjacent skills that we've decided the company absolutely needs in order to succeed. Right? All of these skills could get hired onto the design team, but then good luck finding a designer who can do all this stuff. Um, here's a recent tweet from Archimian. He says, I got an email asking if I knew a designer who can design the office, the brand, the logo, the product, the UX, the visual design, prototype, front end code, wants to start their own company. He says, stop abusing designers, hire more people. And ethically, I really agree with this. Practically also, though, if you try to hire someone who knows all of this stuff, you're going to have a lot of trouble finding them. You're then going to have a lot of trouble paying them because it's going to cost you a lot of money. And finally, it's going to be really hard to set them up for success. Which brings us to our next step, which is asking yourself, what belongs on design? 
So, so far, we were focusing on the entirety of our dumb example company. We listed all the skills that neural networks might need in its ranks in total in order to thrive. And like I said, all of these skills could exist on the design team, but it would spread it super thin. So we have to decide where to put our focus. And so that's what we're going to do now. Right? We're going to see which skills to hire for our team specifically. And the reason we started wide is to make sure that our design team complements other teams in the company and that there's no gaps in the skills we need. Right? So you don't get a design team with a ton of visual design skills or UX skills and you get a project management team that does really high level stuff and no one knows how to do project management. And so you end up with a team with a lot of gaps. So all of those skills highlighted in the last step are still going to be really important. And the skills we don't pick, we're still going to hire somewhere in our company. So before I jump into this step, something I've seen a lot of leaders do, and something I've done myself, is we have our own set of skills. We have our own personality makeup. And we look at it and we say, you know, I trust myself with these things that I have to do. We probably need people exactly like me. So I'm a hybrid. I design and I code. We need more people who design and code. This makes sense, right? But I think that leads to some really horrendous hiring practices. It leads to like homogeneity and echo chambers, uh, which means you're not tackling things from different perspectives and you're not helping each other grow. And it also, more importantly than that, the assumption might be wrong, right? You're coming from a place of bias and you're like, uh, someone like me could do this. And you're like, maybe not. Maybe someone else would do a better job. So quick point. Anyway, these are the skills that we've absolutely we've decided we absolutely need to hire for. So let's see what we can remove from design to increase our focus. So maybe business and long-term strategy can belong with PMs rather than designers. And then presentation skills too, because that's what we're using to show these strategies to leadership, right? Then PMs can deal with that. Uh, no one get mad, this is hypothetical. Also like the best PM, PD relationships that I've ever seen have a lot of overlap. Right? A lot of people can do these skills, and that doesn't mean you can't hire designers onto your team with these skills. But it, it's also really important for each person to know their responsibilities really well and have clarity into that. So complementary skills are great. Um, data analysis and growth hacking could also be shifted to product, perhaps to the data or sales team. And then instead of overloading designers with engineering work, so back-end dev is something I just crossed out, maybe... <laughs> Maybe we hire some engineers before growing a design team of back-end engineers. So I'm going to leave front-end dev very purposefully on right now, because in a startup, realistically, we're going to have to code a bit. It's also really hard to hire full-stack engineers. Um, but as we hire more engineers, we might be able to offload some of these responsibilities. So this is always shifting. Again, the company needs these skills. So we're not just crafting the design team. We want it to make the company successful. Right, so making sure the various complementary roles work with each other within the company is going to be critical. Um, oh yeah, this is the same thing. <laughs> anyway, designers don't need to have them, so we're going to remove them. So this is getting better, but this is still a lot to ask for a single designer. Um, so we're going to move on to our next and final step in this stage, which is asking ourselves which skills are baseline. So baseline here refers to the skills that every single person on your team needs to have. It's like in a sports team. You wouldn't want to only hire good quarterbacks and pitchers because then no one will be a good goalie. That's how it works, right? Hashtag sports. At the same time, people in every one of these roles, you know, on a sports team, to the extent of my obviously limited knowledge, probably needs the baseline level of athleticism and spatial awareness, right? Those are the baseline skills for all of these roles. So at DigitalOcean, we used to bias, I think, understandably towards candidates who are especially technical. Um, but one of the best designers I ever hired wasn't technical at all. She didn't really know how to code that much. She didn't have any context into developer workflows. But she really understood systems and she could design them. And that's what DigitalOcean is. It's a system or a series of systems. So she just learned the rest over time. And what we found as a result was that coding wasn't really a baseline skill for us as we assumed before. Systems thinking was way more important. But most important, I think, was the ability to learn quickly. 
That's what allowed her to build knowledge and to design effective solutions. Right? In my opinion, it's the most valuable skill on this list. It means we can stop treating these requirements as requirements because we trust that our new hires will learn them quickly and do the job they need to do. So let's make them pink. Pink denotes <laughs> um, that I want this expertise on my team, but not every designer needs to know them from the get-go in order for the team at large to thrive. So one designer who's amazing at Figma could quickly upskill the rest of the team. So in this imaginary team from before, you'll see that most of it has generalist tendencies, right? They're good at a bunch of things on this graph. But there's also some individual expertise here, right? One person is an expert in UX, another person in development. There's a lot of room there to mentor and grow others in these areas, and you'll see the entire team become stronger as a result. This only works, though, if we foster the right culture, right? A culture of growth where our designers organically mentor each other. Which brings me to the next really important skill I think every designer on the team needs to have in order for this to work, which is they need to know how to teach, how to explain concepts, and how to upskill others. So when everyone learns and teaches well, I think hiring becomes a totally different you know, ball game, as Jack Sports again. It's no longer about getting a designer who knows everything, it's about building a composition. For instance, at GitHub, I recently started doing research office hours. Um, as a result, other designers have become way, way more comfortable in building research plans and conducting testing sessions, and they started passing this knowledge on to each other, learning new things, teaching me things. Right? We also have designers who are better at JavaScript or know more about developer workflows or working with data and so forth. So we play off of each other and everyone grows. So to recap, so far in the process, in our neural networks example, we started by figuring out which skills of those that are relevant to us the company really needs, company lens. And then we figure out the subset of those skills, the talent that needed to exist on the design team. And now we're gonna figure out the subset of the design team skills that needs to be known by every single designer in order for the team and the company to succeed. People with me so far? Great, I get a thumbs up. So we're gonna bring the skills back. So we've decided that all of these bold skills are really important and we still agree with that. Right? But some of these skills can be brought in by individuals, and that's what the pink skills are. Let's see which of these skills is an absolute must for designers to grow. So first off, these two skills, right? we've established that they're crucial if we're going to hire in this way. So I'm going to treat them as baseline. I also want to build a solid, professional-looking product. And in order to do that, I think everyone on the team needs to have baseline visual design skills, product sense, and system design skills, at least initially. And realistically, at least for now, if we want to ship stuff, we're going to need to do front-end engineers until we have enough engineers. Um, for the rest of these, I think I can rely on individuals in the team, right? And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment, but let's get rid of these with cool animations, technology. But for now, this is what our final prioritization looks like. We're in another layout, our baseline, and then our supplementary skills, also known as Requirements and bonus skills. Everyone's like, whoa. So at this point, you can rank them based on importance to you. You can build an interview plan that assesses these skills using behavioral questions or whatever, and write a charming blog post and get to hiring. Cool. Step three, evolve. So if you haven't noticed yet, this is just a design process. We've just reached the iteration phase, which means asking yourself, is it working over and over again all the time? So we're going to look at the example of our hypothetical team within Neural Vetworks hiring over time. Here's a bigger graph, right? It's similar to the one we've been using so far. Each one of those prongs represents one of the skills we've put together. These ones represent our baseline skills. And then the shape represents the minimum competency at each of the skills we want our designers to have. Does that make sense, more or less? Cool? Yeah, big graph, I know. So let's get to hiring. Our first hire covers basically our baseline. Right? They have the, the baseline skills that ability to learn quickly, system design, all of those skills. That's what we needed. Our second designer might have all of those skills, but also bring in some leadership qualities, some research experience, 
Our third hire might have those skills, but also bring in some rapid prototyping and industry knowledge in healthcare, right? And then another designer, again, on top of the skills we're requiring, but has some experience in service design, maybe designing with AI, right? So at this point, we see we have pretty good coverage of our baseline skills and even some com coverage in supplementary skills as well. So we can take a moment to ask ourselves, is it working? There's a lot of really powerful questions that you can ask. For instance, which skills have you already hired for? And is it as important to hire for those skills now that you have them on your team? Has your team makeup changed? Has anyone gained new skills? Has anyone left? Do you need to backfill those skills? Have your sourcing efforts so far been unsuccessful? So maybe your baseline skills are asking a bit too much and you need to reassess how much you need. Have you realized a new gap in your team? Right, so did you notice your team is bad at prioritizing things? Maybe you need more of that there. Does it take too long to prototype? Does validation not happen early enough? So maybe there's skills that you need that you didn't account for early on. Or has the company's or team's needs changed? Have circumstances changed? So at DigitalOcean, my team initially covered all of front end. We built the whole thing, mainly because we didn't have enough engineers who knew that stuff at the time. And this pushed us to become really tech heavy, like all the way out to the dev side, due to way too much time spent in the code base, fixing bugs. We didn't really have time for design. And when I started leading the team, my first decision in an email I sent out to everyone was, we're not coding anymore. And people really love that, right? Um, but at this point, we had enough engineers with the right skill set, and we noticed that us as a team weren't really successful, right? So the circumstances of what we needed changed. And so this let us shift our team focus and skill set much more towards research, more design exploration, et cetera. And the do a job description changed as a result as well. But these things are always in flux. So while you started here, feel free to shift things as things move, right? So maybe at this point, I need more marketing experience on my team and front end isn't as important anymore. So my next designer doesn't need to cover all of those baseline skills, but really needs writing skills. So we add someone with some writing skills, right? Knack for copywriting. And then maybe we can start hiring specialists, one for information architecture, one for research and rapid prototyping, right? And you see how the coverage grows. Right? And the really cool thing happens as your designers interact with each other and play off of each other. Right? People become really interested in new areas and learn skills from each other, and they get better at a lot of this stuff. The coverage grows. Right? People are just learning from each other. And then you start getting a lot of designers who become good at these things and competent. Right? So the team grows stronger as a whole. Not everyone knows everything, but there's always someone to consult. Right? And your team is able to execute on every single thing it needs to without everyone knowing everything. And that means that your team isn't just a set of individuals anymore. It's an organic composition with different members balancing each other out and growing each other. And bonus, it isn't just for new teams. So if you already have a team, you can go through the exact same process. You can evaluate what the company needs, evaluate where everyone on the team stands within those needs, where the gaps are in your team stack, what you need to fill. Also, hiring new people isn't the only way to fill those skills. So when I say foster a culture of growth, that's not just limited to mentorship from people who are experts, right? Members of your team can also learn this stuff on their own. Healthy teams, I think, have a lot of growth opportunities. And some of these are horizontal, which means I'm not trying to get a new title necessarily, but I really want to build a new skill set that's going to help me in the future. And so it doesn't really matter, I think, how you get the right skills on your team, just that you know what those right skills are and that you do get them. And that's literally it. I hope you found some of this stuff valuable. We're gonna recap real quick. We've gone through, through three high-level sections. The first one is learn. It's basically a deep dive that informs the rest of this process. Right? So get inspiration from industry job descriptions. Start building that list in your head. Learn from leaders who've built design teams. Get an understanding of what you might need in yours. And take all of this to step two, which is analyze. Analyze is a funnel, right? Use that understanding that you built in the first step to build that comprehensive list. Filter it down by skills that the company really needs. 
instead of just cargo culting. Filter that to skills uh, the design team should be responsible for. And then filter to baseline skills that every single designer needs. Right? So you're basically chipping away at this until you have just the bare essentials. And the secret sauce here is that culture of growth I talked about. Right? If your team isn't mentoring each other and learning from each other, then composing your team in this way just doesn't work. And then step three is evolving. So regularly question your assumptions. Right? Is your team working the way you want? You need to evolve your understanding of what your team needs. Adjust your job description and hiring as happens. And when possible, grow people internally. Do this regularly forever, just iterate. And like everything in design, it depends. Um, this talk is called Building Appropriate Teams because they have to be right for you. And that means the process can also be different based on the company, based on what you need. Um, but no matter what I think, what I want you to take away from this is to be more intentional about your hiring needs. So take that thoughtful design mindset that you all have and then use it to build the best team for you. Thank you. <laughs>